Hello, this is Erica with Launching Legacies. Welcome to our daily devotional. Today we are continuing our devotional series on drama. Um, remember, we're looking at people who have a problem with uh, just a lot of drama in their life. Um, and it becomes a problem like they're addicted to it and the drama becomes distracting. So uh, first I want to let you know that if you are a person who has people who are very dramatic around you, you would not be the first and you're sure not going to be the last. Um, but if we go back and look look at the Bible, we find actually um, a lot of examples of dramatic people, but one in particular, uh, a family that has a lot of drama that makes it easier for us to understand what's happening. Remember um, yesterday, I gave the suggestion that if you are the person who is uh, causing the drama, that you have to learn to be accountable, that that's important. If you are the person who uh, usually runs away from the dr the drama, that you need to learn to stand um, and, and recognize how to handle the situation more appropriately. We separate the behavior from the person. And then thirdly, um, I can't remember what the third piece of advice was. <laughs> no, the, if you're not either one of them, you need to be able to pray, right? And so the third person um, represents somebody who maybe is not running away from it or causing it, but sees it and needs to be an intercessor. They need to be praying. So those are the three uh, pieces of advice that I gave you. But let's look at a story uh, from the Bible. I think I talk about the story uh, often when I talk about dysfunction dysfunctional families. And so we'll look at the story of David, uh, King David. No, not a hard thing to imagine um, because if you know anything about the story of King David and his family, things get real dicey. Um, so if we're looking at 2 Samuel, um, we can go to the 13th chapter through the 15th chapter and we hear this story of what happens with David and his children. And if this is not the epitome of drama. Nothing is like there's a lot of stuff going on. Now here, I want to make a note before I start to talk about it, because you're going to probably be thinking uh, what many people are thinking. Well, this is just sin and this is just an iniquity. And so uh, there was pronounced upon David a calamity because of his uh, treatment of Bathsheba and um and Uriah so want to talk about that really quickly though because although there's a pronunciation of an of trouble coming there an iniquity or a generational iniquity which some people think that's what's wrong with their families that we have all these generational iniquity just to be clear an iniquity is something that's unrepentant meaning that people have not turned away from it and so if you have generational iniquities the solution is literally to just turn right to repent and then the iniquity is turned around and iniquity is an unrepented sin something that's gone on for generations that's never been turned away from so for example um, lying or gambling, a person can have, um, you know, just think it's normal to gamble because everybody they knew gambled and everybody does. And so everybody lies and everybody does this. And so everybody's doing it, practicing it. And no one ever turns away from it because they never think of it as a problem that needs to be turned away from. Instead, they continue in it and it becomes what we can consider compulsive or what the world terms compulsive. But really, it's something that needs to be turned away from. Now, there may be healing, there may be some work that needs to be done in order for that turning to happen but technically when the turn happens and when that's departed from then it's no longer an iniquity because it's been repented of it's been turned away from so i just want to keep that in mind because samuel says to uh, i mean sorry nathan says to um to david that the uh, i'm going to read the scripture it says now therefore this is uh second samuel 12 10 through 11 and so it says now therefore the sword will never depart from your house out of your own household i'm going to bring calamity upon you okay and so what's happening is he's saying look there's going to be some difficulties they're going to that's going to come to your household okay but at any point people could turn away from it because calamity coming doesn't mean it has to come through me right and so there's a choice that has to be recognized in all all dramatic situations and people who have a lot of drama in their life often don't think of it this way, but you can choose whether or not you're going to stay in this line of foolishness and mayhem, or if you're going to walk away and go into another direction. So those of you who are working on being accountable for the drama that you are a part of, you don't have to say it. You don't have to do it. You don't have to be there. 
that's it. And if you don't realize that, then there is some more work that needs to be done with personal accountability and decision making. But that's the first step to understand. There's a choice. I'm choosing to say it, do it, and be here. And if I don't choose that, then things will be very different because I won't be here. <laughs> and I won't be saying it and I won't be doing it. So those things are noted. But let's go back to the story. So what happens in synopsis is this. David has a whole bunch of kids. That's not a surprise. Um, okay. He's the king, but he has a whole bunch of kids. He has a daughter and he has a son. They are how we're going to really start this. So Amnon is his son, his oldest son, who would be the heir. And Tamar is his daughter. And they are half brother and sister. And so... Amnon decides that he really, he's in love with her. He doesn't know what to do with her. It looks like just like infatuation is just crazy, right? And so he has this whole obsession with her and him and his friend um, kind of plot together or whatever to figure out how to get, tam how to trick Tamar and to get her over to him, to Amnon's uh in Amnon's presence. So when Amnon gets her there, of course, he's burning with fire for her and all of a sudden he rapes her. And she really tries to talk him out of that because it's a social issue that creates a lot of problems for Tamar in particular, but it's inappropriate, right? This is her brother. And so she she's trying to talk him out of it and it's a no-go. He won't listen. He won't, you know, respect her and he rapes her and then he re and then after he rapes her, he no longer is though in love with her. Now he hates her and he rejects her, which is a problem because according to the law, he would need to marry her after he raped her. I know that sounds crazy too, because who's going to want to marry their rapist? But at the end of the day, he doesn't marry her. He doesn't keep her. He rejects her. And in the midst of that rejection process, her other brother, Tamar's other brother, Absalom, finds out what Amnon has done, okay? And he has a problem with that. And the attention is brought to David. So David finds out what's going on, right? This is their father, and he does nothing about it. And so now you got real drama. The dad finds out that the brother raped the sister and does nothing about it. And so Absalom is pretty much indignant. He's just like done. He's frustrated, angry. And what he ends up doing is killing his brother Amnon. Okay. After killing Amnon, then, um, I'm making sure I'm pacing through the story correctly. So he, after killing Amnon, then he starts this whole coup. So remember, Amnon is the firstborn. We don't really know. There's other children between Absalom and Amnon, but we don't hear about them. So we don't know if they, whatever they did. They maybe abdicated the throne or they maybe, um, died in, as children. We really don't know what happened to them. But what hap but what's next is now Absalom realizes that he should be, uh, taking the throne and so he starts this with this big giant coup and at, at some point his father is even running away from him and he's going to try to take the throne he also sleeps with david's concubine which is of course inappropriate the concubine is is the king's but he sleeps with her and does all this public showing of uh him being a demonstration of goodness and the the next a ruler. So imagine now he starts a campaign against his father. It's drama, drama, drama. Okay. And it seems crazy, but here goes the thing. Let's pull back. We talked about iniquity and I told you that everybody has a choice. You, uh, even we, we can get so spiritual that we forget that we have free will and we need to not do that, right? Because every person has a soul and in that soul is their will and their will is of their own volition, meaning they choose what they want to do. And so when we talk about an iniquity or generational or otherwise, this is something that we can choose to walk away from. So Absalom is not bound to his behavior. He chose to do the things that he did and it's in a Appropriate what he chose to do. Now, Amnon is inappropriate as well, but again, these are all choices. So we're, we're not, he's not so bound that he can't be, be righteous. He's just bound and choosing not to be righteous because there's a many stories in the Old Testament of people who were from an unrighteous family or from an unrighteous situation and, and were righteous despite the odds. So we see that this can definitely be a, a choice. It doesn't happen to be one here in this story. And so what is the issue behind all the drama? Well, one is there's a feeling of injustice. And so we find that drama typically comes and stems in a family in particular from these systems of or feelings of injustice or lack of control like there's something really wrong here and so Absalom maybe his whole intent was to take the take the the crown and that's why he killed his brother Amnon who was the successor the natural successor but 
there's clearly an issue that arises up in him that makes him feel like he's a better king than whomever else could be king. And so he finds this system of injustice and he gets prideful and arrogant and that rises up. We're going to stop right there for right now and, and kind of talk about what this is part of this uh, drama that just that gets us entangled looks like when we have injustice and we're going to have injustice because we're a part of this world system and there's just chaos and people make bad decisions and families are unhealthy and so there are going to be some injustices that happen but when those injustices happen and people really feel slighted like they've been disregarded or mistreated in some major way what typically results is a lot of drama a lot of painful interactions between uh, siblings sibling cousins whatever family members, they start to be cantankerous towards each other and do what we would say would be inappropriate or ill will things to one another. And typically that's how drama starts. Even if it's just gossip or a slight word or somebody said this or you borrowed this and then you didn't treat it right. There's a complete, when injustice and a lack of control kind of filters into a situation, it makes chaos bring itself to the forefront and there's a disregard for the value or the esteem or the integrity of things and so what we need to be mindful of if we're the people who cause that drama if that's one of us that's okay we have to recognize it then we need to be accountable to where are you hurt where do you feel like there's been a lack of justice that needs to be on the forefront of your mind because that's the issue that needs to be dealt with. If you are the person who's avoiding the circumstances, you need to just speak. Where has this person been treated unjustly? Where has their control been taken away from them? How are they feeling powerless? Just acknowledge it. Again, not an excuse, but first step. Third person, if you're an intercessor, pray against the injustice and the lack of control that is infused in the family that has made people disloyal to one another and mistreating one another. Pray about that. Start to really bring these things to the forefront because if we're going to dismantle drama in family systems and friendships and organizations, we have to first recognize that drama usually comes from a feeling of injustice and that injustice must be dealt with because we're humans and we need resolution. And so that's our uh, suggestion for today. You are welcome to read this story about David and his uh, children because it's quite interesting. And if you join us tomorrow, we'll dismantle a second part of how drama can infect a family and create distractions. We are praying for you. We hope that you would heal, live, and grow because that is our mission to provide health, healing, um, new life through better choices, better directions, and through the power of God in our lives, and that you, people would not just heal and live, but they would also grow and flourish, and that they would have a good life. They would launch their legacy. All right, we're hoping that you're praying for us as well, and we'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow for the second or third part of this devotional series. Until then, be blessed.